We welcome you once more to the Working Class Movement Library series of Invisible Histories Talks. Particularly, we welcome our speaker, Hazel Kent, who will be talking to us about Fenner Brockway's conscientious objection during the First World War, a topic she researched in our library, amongst other places. We have a very interesting collection of material relating to the No Conscription Fellowship and about individual COs. The library's events are, as usual, free. However, we would, as usual, like to encourage you to support the library if you're able to do so, and there is a donate button on our website. Okay, thanks very much, Hazel. Over to you. Okay, I'll just get my slides up. There we go. Okay, that's okay. Is that okay? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so Fenner Brockway, um, obviously a well-known name in the labour movement. Um, and you'll know, I'm sure, that he had a remarkably lengthy political career. And he's perhaps best known for his work against imperialism in the 1950s and the 1960s. He was the Labour MP for Eton and Slough, 1950 to 1964. And afterwards, he became Lord Brockway remaining an active and radical member of the House of Lords until his death in 1988. My own interest in his work for peace led me to researching and writing my doctoral thesis on his work for the Independent Labour Party between 1922 and 1946. And I'm currently working on an article about his conscientious objection in the First World War. And so that's the aspect that I want to talk to you about today. Brockway was a journalist and a socialist, and by 1912 he had become editor of the Independent Labour Party's Labour leader when he was only 24 years old. Catherine Marshall, who worked alongside him in the No Conscription Fellowship, described him as one of the ablest of the young socialists and a really fine speaker. When the First World War broke out, he was adamantly opposed to it. And between 1916 and 1919, he spent 28 months in prison as a result of his conscientious objection to military service. He became a leading absolutist conscientious objector, so he wanted complete exemption from doing anything to do with the war. Many of the conscientious objectors were prepared to do some sort of alternative service, but the absolutists were a vocal and influential minority. So I want to start with talking a little bit about his beliefs before I then move on to talking about his, his experiences. Um, Brockway had been brought up in a very religious household. His parents were nonconformist missionaries and he spent his infant years in India. His education continued this religious trend and he attended the School for the Sons of Missionaries at Blackheath in London. However, he decided to decline a place at Oxford because it was conditional on him becoming a minister of religion and he decided to train as a journalist instead. His first jobs in journalism were for religious newspapers, but as he became involved in socialist politics, he moved away from organized religion. Instead, he developed a strong spiritual conception of humanity which he later described as humanist or universalist. Martin Sedell, the well-known historian of pacifism, notes that Brockway, along with Clifford Allen, who was the chair of the No Conscription Fellowship, he notes that they were highly unusual in that socialism became a complete surrogate for their former Christian beliefs, that socialism was his religion. But I would suggest that the Christian foundations of Brockway's belief system remain clearly visible at this time, both in his actions and in his words. Brockway's short 1916 book, Socialism for Pacifists, um, you can see my, a photo of my rather grubby copy <laughs> of that book, it's well thumbed, not just by me, I think, that one. Um, that short book provides a clear outline of his ideas about socialism during the First World War. The whole of socialism for pacifists is imbued with quasi-religious language, a legacy of Brockway's non-conformist upbringing. 
For example, he describes socialism as the economic expression of the kingdom of God and argues that socialism enables its adherents to move beyond individual faith towards social righteousness. And in this little book, Brockway distinguishes clearly between the church with a capital C that he thinks has been corrupted by capitalism and the great truths embodied by the teachings of Jesus. The core of his socialism was a belief in the inherent equality of all human beings, irrespective of class, gender or race. And he had a real desire to revolutionize human relationships to reflect this equality. He wrote in Socialism for Pacifists on the page that I've got on the slide. Um, if it be true that human life is sacred, that with the birth of every child, the divine spirit is reincarnated, our first communal duty must be to secure that this divinity shall have full opportunity of expression. And so I think his case illustrates really well the mixture of motivations that led to objections to war. He's very often noted in books about conscientious objection as, as a political objector. And certainly the basis of his conscientious objection to military service was certainly political, but it's, as you can see, also very much based in spirituality. The quote on the screen on the right hand side is, is from a little booklet um, put out by several leading conscientious objectors explaining why they decided to object. And this here, Brockway encapsulates his, his reasoning. I'm a socialist and my socialism is based on a belief in the sacredness of human life and the unity of all human lives. War is the antithesis of socialism. It destroys human life and denies the unity of humanity. And he, he consistently expresses these views throughout the war. When he was trying to explain his position to the Central Tribunal, Brockway complained that the Stockport and East Cheshire Appeal Tribunal had completely misunderstood him because they had commented that his objection appeared to be more of a political nature than a conscientious objection to combat and warfare. Brockway wrote to them, my political objection is an expression of my moral and religious objection. I believe human life to be sacred. I believe human lives to be one in a universal life. So that leads on to this, this concept of witnessing for peace that I've become quite taken with when I've been researching Brockway's experiences in the First World War. Um, and if you look how the Quakers define this, they talk about witness as action inspired by faith. And they, because they use silence in their meetings rather than preaching, their actions constitute a living sermon. And Brockway consistently uses this idea of witnessing um, when he talks about the First World War, and he uses the idea within the First World War as well. So we've got two examples on the screen here. Um, so from 1974, in an oral history interview he did for the Imperial War Museum, he uses the term witnessing for peace to describe what he did in the First World War. And the second example from that little book, Socialism for Pacifists, the dedication talks about his comrades who are witnessing to their socialist and pacifist principles. Um, so I think there's no doubt he uses this term very deliberately. And he was in the process of living out a socialist conviction that, as I've explained, it has its basis in spirituality. Unlike many of the Quakers, not all I know, but many of them who, because they were more likely to agree to some sort of alternative service than the so-called political objectors, Brockway was perceived by the authorities as a threat and placed under constant surveillance. And Brockway's witness for peace was vocal, was strident and persistent in expressing his opinions in a variety of different ways. 
so as I said, this, this kind of idea of witness, it's really captured my attention at the moment. And I thought it was really interesting because um, I've been reading more about it, that at the time of the early church, so going back centuries, the idea of a witness becomes virtually synonymous with becoming a martyr. Um, and I've also read some interesting um, work recently by Quentin, Quentin Outram and Keith Laban, who've written about secular martyrdom, um, and they link that to the idea of being a witness, because it all links back to the Greek word martyrs. So I think all that's fascinating, and I think it, it's an interesting lens through which to look at, at um, Brockway's conscientious objection. So what I want to do now is talk to you a little bit about his actual experiences, what happened to him during the First World War, and, and try and see how these ideas apply to that. So as you'd expect for a journalist, much of his work for peace involved the written word. He was an idealistic and energetic young editor and he opposed the war from the very start. So on the slide, you can see the front page of the Labour leader um, from August the 6th, 1914. Um, and I think it makes his views pretty clear as editor, um, not once but twice, down with the war, double underlined for emphasis. And he explains, workers of Great Britain, you have no quarrel with the workers of Europe. They have no quarrel with you. The quarrel is between the ruling classes of Europe. Don't make their quarrel yours. And he takes this line consistently as editor of the Labour leader. Um, he provides weekly updates and commentary on anti-war activity. But it's not just his written journalism. Um, he also regularly speaks at public meetings, often near, near to Manchester, because he was living there near the start of the war. The Labour leader was edited there. And he persisted with this, even though his, his talks were not always very well received. Um, so one occasion saw him trying to speak to a howling mob for two hours. And in the end, they needed the police to escort Brockway and his fellow anti-war speaker to safety. Um, and he was almost thrown from a canal bridge, apparently. Um, undeterred, he went back in June 1916. He went back to Marple to organise another anti-war rally um, and again was met with serious antagonism. The North Cheshire Herald reported that there were three attempts to stop the meeting. And Mr Braddock apparently used his motor car engine to disrupt the meeting, trying to silence Brockway by preventing the crowd from hearing his speech. But this wasn't enough for Brockway. He soon became frustrated by the lack of unified anti-war action in the Labour movement, and he decided to take matters into his own hands. But in this spirit of witnessing, he clearly felt deeds and not only words were needed to oppose the war and, and conscription. And he was worried about conscription right from the start of the war, because obviously there was a volunteer army until conscription was brought in until 1916. But Brockway was agitating against conscription right from the beginning. His wife, Lilla, who he had married just two weeks after the war broke out, suggested it would be a good idea to, to have an organization that would bring together young men who were gonna refuse to serve. So Brockway wrote the little letter you can see on the slide um, to himself, because he's the editor of the Labour leader, so he published it for himself. That was quite convenient. Um, and th that letter's canvassing opinion and asking people to send their names in. And names began to flood in to the Brockways cottage. Um, you can see the little row of, of cottages in Mellor that they were living in at the time. Lilla initially acted as secretary, but soon the membership grew so big and there were people all over the country. Um, they opened an office in London at, at the start of 1915. Brockway brought together a diverse group to form an initial committee. Clifford Allen became the chairman and Brockway acted as national secretary. And the No Conscription Fellowship had members and branches all over the country, so it was a big organisation. As we've heard, it, ha it has its own newspaper, the Tribunal, which you can read in the library. Um, and 
It had a duplicate organisation ready to act when its leaders were imprisoned. And I think it's fair to say it is viewed as the most significant anti-war organisation of the First World War. When conscription was introduced in 1916, the organisation continued to campaign against it, but it also served as a source of information and support for conscientious objectors. Brockway would have been exempt from military service as an editor of a newspaper, but he decided deliberately to resign from the Labour leader to give his full attention to the No Conscription Fellowship, and as he later put it, to go through it on the same basis as the other members. And I think once again, this emphasizes his determination to take action. He, he didn't want to just sit in his office and kind of direct the organization. He wanted to actively witness for peace. The authorities made several attempts to stop Brockway and his anti-war activities, and they were closely monitoring him throughout. There are various um, examples of, of censorship before he becomes a conscientious objector. Um, so his play, um, as he, he wrote a couple of plays at this time, he was prolific in his writing. Um, his play, The Devil's Business, which was an explicit critique of the government's relationships with the armaments manufacturers, um, and there's a copy of that in, in the Working Class Museum Library as well. Um, that was banned in 1915. Um, and he had to attend court on a number of occasions for publishing seditious material in the Labour leader whilst he was still editor and had to go to court to defend the contents of the articles. Um, but he relished those opportunities and used the occasions to rail against police censorship and the threat that it posed to free speech. And then the, the incident that the photographs um, depict on the slides are, are when Brockway was initially imprisoned under the Defence of the Realm Act. Um, you can just see him there in the middle um, and on the other side, on, on the right, on the far right of the picture, he's not normally described as on the far right of anything, but there he is. Um, so in July 1916, the government took proceedings against the members of the National Committee of the No Conscription Fellowship for producing a leaflet against the Conscription Act. Um, and so they're, they're dutifully in these pictures taking themselves off to hand themselves in. Um, because of that. And Brockway served 10 days in Pentonville on that occasion before it was decided to pay his £100 fine so he could continue his work for the No Conscription Fellowship. And so it, it was in November 1916, he was arrested under the Military Service Act. So this is the Conscription Act. And I'm sure you know tribunals have been set up by the government to consider those who wish to be exempt from military service, including conscientious objectors, but they weren't just for conscientious objectors. Brockway appeared before pretty much every tribunal you could appear before. Um, so he was appearing before the local, the appeal, the central tribunal, um, and before the Pelham Committee that organised work of national importance. But in every, on every occasion, he consistently refused all military and any offer of alternative service. He described taking alternative service as a comparatively easy course of action. And, and so he was determinedly an absolutist all the way through. He saw each appearance before a tribunal as another opportunity to make his case and ensured his statements were published in the tribunal newspaper, the No Conscription Fellowships newspaper. In a court appearance, for example, on the 28th of November, 1916, he explained, acts of parliament may deem me to be a soldier. Tribunals may decide that I must be a soldier. You may hand me over to the military to become a soldier. Officers may order me to fulfill the duties of a soldier. 
but no power on earth can make me do what I believe to be wrong. I can only trust that my actions in the immediate future may prove the sincerity of the views I have so often expressed. I count it as a privilege that I have been called upon to witness to my faith in internationalism and peace. So Brockway was there, but therefore forcibly ordered into military custody and spent his first night in the Tower of London, no less, um, before being court-martialed at Chester Castle for refusal to obey orders. He served some of this first sentence, which the first one was 112 days at hard labour, at Wormwood Scrubs, and then he was transferred to Wandsworth. Once his sentence was over, he was taken back to military custody at, Sen at Chester Castle and court-martialed again. And he was then sent to Walton Prison in Liverpool. And then finally, in August 1918, he was transferred to Lincoln Prison. He was court-martialed three times in all, serving 28 months in total. And in going to prison, Brockway was practically keen to have this experience. And I think suffering for his faith was an important part of his witness for peace. And that's where I'm, I'm quite interested in this connection with the notion of secular martyrdom. Um, on his way to prison on November the 29th, 1916, writing to Catherine Marshall, that you can feel in the letter, he seems almost giddy with excitement. He says to her, so far, my journey in the military has been a delightful adventure. Lilla is with me now and my escorts have been gems. Today has been a day I shall never forget. And he also found time on the same day to scribble a longer letter to CA or Clifford Allen. And he noted that we are all entirely happy and content and look forward confidently to the future realising that each one of us is doing a little to achieve our common purpose. And he also noted that this will be a time of great preparation for us all, a time of spiritual deepening and mental calming. I'm perfectly happy in that thought, as I know you are. So at first, it's like he's really relishing his new surroundings. It's not quite an unusual reaction to being in prison, perhaps. Um, and he later wrote, I was proud to undergo it as a witness to our anti-war convictions. And for a start, he cooperated. He undertook prison work, sewing mailbags, and he mainly followed the rules. But following his second court martial, his mood had definitely darkened and changed. And he decided that he would pit his wits against the authorities and try and defeat them whenever he could. One thing that he did um, was that the No Conscription Fellowship were helping prisoners smuggle in pencil leads in order to help them communicate. And so Brockway, forever the journalist, used these to produce a prison newspaper, The Walton Leader. And he produced it twice a week on tiny bits of toilet paper, you know, the old fashioned scratchy um, toilet paper collecting stories from others. He spent hours rewriting the stories in small, neat capitals, um, and they used the lavatory as the reading room. And it was produced for quite a while before it was discovered. Brockway was sent to punishment cells on, bread and water, on the bread and water diet for six days afterwards as a punishment for doing it. Um, and he also wrote letters which were smuggled out of the prison or on these little scraps of toilet paper um, and I think one of the best moments I've had in, in researching about Brockway was in the Carlisle archives in Catherine Marshall's papers when, when I found one of these little toilet paper letters to Lilla just sitting there in the box. That was quite amazing. So he was resisting in that he was producing this prison newspaper, but he also began to feel he should resist in other ways to change the system. He was particularly against the silence rule. Prisoners weren't allowed to speak to each other. Um, and he questioned, was I so spiritless that I would allow anyone to forbid me the elementary right of human speech? So 
He told the governor that he would not remain silent any longer and not content with just telling the governor that, um, he then decided to write to the Home Secretary. Um, and you can see this is what's on the screen, a copy of a document that was sent um, via the No Conscriptions Fellowship to the Home Secretary, where he's saying, I think it right to acquaint you with the fact that I can no longer recognise any obligation to obey prison rules. I have come to realise recently that acquiescence in the violation of freedom is a serious thing against one's highest personality. So I think, again, that's coming, it comes back in, in, in the other parts of the letter. He's talking about um, spirituality and, and how it's violating his intrinsic beliefs. So having announced that he was going to break the rules, um, he didn't just leave it at that. He led a mass resistance against prison rules amongst the conscientious objectors who were all being hold, held on the same floor in Walton Jail. Um, and in typical Brockway style, he set up a committee um, where they were all sort of organising what would happen. And there were all sorts of, of what we, I guess, now would talk about as well-being events organised, like lectures and concerts. Um, and so it sounds like they had a final time for 10 days, um, after which the authorities acted and removed him to Lincoln. And, and that was when the revolt stopped and Brockway was placed in, in solitary confinement in Lincoln for the remainder of his time in prison for another eight months. As with most absolutist conscientious objectors, Brockway's witness for peace at times risked his health and well-being, and in Brockway's case and others, those of their family as well. In his autobiography um, that was written 25 years later, Inside the Left, he describes incidents when he was in personal danger, both in Marple, um, near his, his cottage in Mellor in Stockport. And we've heard about one of them earlier, um, but on another occasion, five men laid in wait on the canal bank and beat him up. Um, and he was kicked and, and dragged to the edge of the canal, but he was saved um, once again by the appearance of someone walking further down the path and the five men fled. And the impact of prison on some conscientious objectors' physical health was serious. And in, indeed a number died as a direct result of their incarceration. And others, including Clifford Allen, suffered permanent ill health as a consequence. Brockway was less severely affected physically. Um, and in August, 1917, he wrote, but he was writing to Lilla, his wife, I don't know anyone who is so unharmed by prison physically as I am. Even after seven days on number one diet, I remained well. But as time went by, he too suffered pain and discomfort as a result of his time in prison when he was placed in the punishment cell and on starvation rations because they'd found out about the newspaper, the Walton Leader. He later recalled he became so weak that he lay down on the cell floor. I was in kind of coma, half awake, half asleep. In Lincoln, he was on punishment diet for a month until the medical officer intervened and the cold in the cell had given him neuritis. He said, it began in my head and passed right down my body, causing me excruciating pain when it reached the stomach. Finally, it settled in my left leg, making it practically paralysed. And he was also suffering from dental problems, which sounded very painful. Um, whilst he was in prison in both Walton and Lincoln, he, he was permitted to get treatment at his own expense. On one occasion, he had his wisdom tooth extracted without any anaesthetic. Um, which I guess might not have been that unusual at the time, but I certainly don't fancy it. Um, although Brockway was prepared to undergo physical suffering as part of his witness for peace, he was opposed to the idea of hunger striking, um, although some conscientious, conscientious objectors did do this. Mental health also seems to have become a problem Initially, as we've seen, he was incredibly positive about going to prison. However, on his release from his first longer sentence, Brockway reflected on the effect of imprisonment 
and said it had had an impact on his concentration and vigour, describing it as numbing. After his first spell in Walton, Brockway wrote, it's the mental strain which is difficult to bear. And I think the hardest time for him was when he was in Lincoln prison in solitary confinement. Um, and he says that the strain of this month after month was disastrous to self-control. The long hours of solitary confinement drove one to the verge of mental and nervous breakdown, which could only be conquered by a great effort of discipline. Brockway later claimed that his sanity in Lincoln was saved by having newspapers smuggled into his cell um, by a group of Sinn Féin prisoners who were also being held on the same floor as Brockway. Um, and they managed to, through their networks, get newspapers into him. They'd heard he was being held in solitary. Um, and interestingly, well, that is a bit of a, an aside, but Brockway was in Lincoln Prison at the same time that Michael Collins organised to break out Eamon de Valera, who, who was in, in Lincoln Prison at the same time. So Brockway was aware of them being there and was aware of the escape. And I mentioned um, it's not just Brockway himself that suffered and, and um, underwent sacrifices as a result of his conscientious object. So his wife, Lilla, whose, whose picture is on the screen there, um, also suffered great hardship, I would say, as a result of his stance, although she completely supported him. His father-in-law, her father, um, William Harvey Smith, wrote to Lloyd George complaining um, about Brockway's treatment. And it's a bit difficult to read, but it, it says, I do not sympathise with the stand that Brockway has taken, and I have nothing to say against imprisonment, but I do protest against the cruel torture of solitary confinement, which in this 20th century ought not to be inflicted upon any man or woman, whatever the offence. Um, so, so he was complaining about that, but he was also complaining on, in the second extract there, um, that this represented the cruel torture of a misguided man and of an innocent wife. Um, and, and Lilla, she got two young children at this point. Um, Audrey was a toddler and Margaret was born at the end of Brockway's first prison sentence. So Lilla had been heavily pregnant when Brockway first went to prison. Um, initially, she saw him quite regularly. She was able to see him in this kind of cat and mouse situation as he was let out and then reconvicted. But by the time he was in Lincoln, she hadn't seen him for months and she hadn't been allowed to visit him. Um, and she, they'd lost the house. She'd had to give up the house that they'd been living in. She couldn't afford to keep the furniture either. And she ended up living in a pacifist community in the south of England, um, in a structure that sounds like a cross between a, a caravan and one of those little wooden chalet things that you might get on, on a holiday camp. Um, and, and I, I, there's a letter that she writes where she says she's a bit, it's okay for now, but she's a bit worried about how it's gonna be with the children in the winter. So I, I think she did suffer real hardship as a result of her husband's stance. But like I say, she, she fully supported Brockway and what he did. So Brockway was finally released. There's a whole batch of absolutist objectors released in April, 1919 and I think we can say his witness for peace had been consistent, impassioned, and at times quite extreme. Um, we've seen that it in included high profile political activity with his editorship of the Labour leader and his leading role in the No Conscription Fellowship, as well as the impassioned and determined engagement with the state machinery of conscription and his his engagement with the tribunals. Um, and I think his witness culminates in this much more solitary and personal and very testing experience of, of prison as a result of him deciding to, to follow his convictions. And of course it doesn't end there because Brockway continued to witness for peace throughout the rest of his long political career. 
So in the 1920s, he chaired both the No More War Movement and War Resisters International. He did renounce his absolute pacifism during the Spanish Civil War when he decided military action could be supported in order to establish socialism. But he went on to chair the Central Board for Conscientious Objectors during the Second World War, and he spoke at lots of tribunals on behalf of objectors, particularly socialist objectors. He later helped to found the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. Um, you can see him on the screen there with an early iteration of that. Um, there he is, second from the left, and a very youthful Tony Benn at the other end. Um, with the anti h bomb campaign in 1954, which wasn't a success, um, but was an early example of anti-nuclear activity. And he chaired the British Council against war in Vietnam. And in 1979, Brockway, who by then was age 91, and Philip Noel Baker, founded the World Disarmament Campaign. His experiences in prison, they also had a direct legacy. He became involved in the Webb's, Sydney and Beatrice Webb's prison system inquiry um, after he left prison. And he published in 1922 with Stephen Hobhouse, another former CO, an enormous report on the current conditions in prison. And that work led to a number of reforms, most notably, the abolition of the notorious silence rule, which Brockway had done, he complained so much about when he was an inmate. His writings about his experience as a First World War CO have had a significant impact on subsequent historical accounts, and um, particularly what he wrote in his autobiography, Inside the Left, which was published in 1942. That's been used a lot in, in subsequent accounts of, of conscientious objection. Um, and I think his exceptionally long political career, continued work for peace, arguably contributed to a growing understanding and tolerance of the position of conscientious objectors in the years after the First World War. Um, and I think that's, that's apt to mention this week because obviously it's um, the 15th of May is Con World Conscientious Objectors Day, isn't it? So we're not far from that. And I think that that legacy um, helping people understand conscientious objection also forms an important aspect of Brockway's witness for peace. And just finally, um, as I finish, I just wanted to mention um, that with um, Paul, who I think is here, Paul Simpson, who at Sunderland University, I think he's watching the talk, we ha have started work on a biography project um, about Fenner Brockway, because amazingly, he wrote lots of volumes of autobiography, but there is no biography of Brockway as yet. So we're hoping to plug that gap. Um, and we've started this blog, um, which if you're interested, it'd be great if you wanted to follow it. And you see the URL there, fennerbrockwayblog.com. Um, and we're hoping to add to it as we're working um, on the biography project over the coming months and years probably. Um, we'd love to hear from you if you've got any information about Brockway. Okay, and that's it. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Hazel. That's that's fantastic. I mean, what an extraordinary character and what an extraordinary couple. Uh, that that's uh, yeah, definitely. You're getting you're getting virtual applause here if you can see the little pictures. Um, Oh. <laughs> and uh, that, yeah, certainly um, it's, it's amazing that there isn't a biography. So um, that's great to hear that there are, there are plans afoot. Uh, folks, if anybody would like to um, contribute, ask a question or make a contribution, you can stick it in the chat or you can wave at me and I will try and uh, see who's... Well, even let me do it. There's quite a few people. So I'm just as anybody... Is anybody waving at me? Ali, Ali, yes, thank you. I'm mute. Hi, thank you so much. That was really fabulous. Um, 
I just wanted to say just something, and you probably know it anyway, but I think when Lila went to um, stay in the caravan, is she went to stay with her sister Muriel, who'd married mm. Reg Sorensen. And they ran a commune, they call it a commune, but it was a farm for uh, men who were um, working on the land as conscientious objectors. And it's in a place called Stan Stanford La Hope in Essex. Fantastic. Thank you, Ali. Um, so I think it's quite interesting because Reg Sorensen became a, another MP. Uh, he becomes another Labour MP. So there's those kind of connections, which I think is yeah. um, interesting anyway. Yeah. Oh, she doesn't look because I'd got all that from a letter that she'd written to Catherine Marshall because yeah. Lilla, Lilla had written so many letters to Catherine Marshall and she's got wonder, mercifully neat handwriting compared to everybody else <laughs> <That's good. Yeah. laughs> involved. So she was talking about this sort of hut thing, which it was feeling a bit so, sorry for her about, but I didn't know all of that. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks. so I think oh. Reg married her sister. So it's all, yeah, Muriel. you know, it's all quite, um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Great. All, all, always good when our speakers get extra info. Thank you very much, Ali. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, Paul, yes. Um. Hi, yeah. Um, just on the Reg Sorensen connection, I'm pretty sure that Reg Sorensen was the first person to um, come up with the idea of an anti-discrimination bill that Brockway then obviously ran with huh. um, with the Race Relations Act, I think. It could be, could be wrong. But I just wanted to ask Hazel about um, some of the ideas you were talking about at the beginning. They sound quite Tolstoyan. And I was wondering whether we know from his memoirs or anything else, whether um, Brockway was influenced by Tolstoy. I can't, I would have to check. I can't really, he, he talks much more about people like George Bernard Shaw mm -hmm. and H.G. Wells. Um, I don't think he mentions Tolstoy, but I would have to check. Um, yeah. yeah, but it's, it's, George Bernard Shaw seems to be everywhere. <laughs> Every time Broadway writes about anybody that's influencing him, and he's constantly reproducing letters that he had from him. So he obviously thought that was a good connection. Um, but no, that's interesting, isn't it? That's something else to think about, definitely. Um, I think, because I, I think that this kind of spiritual element, in a way it's kind of, um, I mean, I'm sure there are, there are more um, serious thinkers that, that speak along those lines, um, but, it's almost empirical in that he has this this experience as a, as a young man where he he feels that nature is one with him and and he's kind of overwhelmed by that feeling of connection with all human beings and every living thing in the world and all that kind of things which is, he writes about it on a number of occasions it sounds quite a you know it's kind of a beautiful experience that he'd had and then that kind of inspires him onward um, so so from that point of view um i think it's quite it's it comes from within almost um but i'm, I'm sure he's he's influenced by a whole variety of other things as well great talk great talk hazel thank you paul <laughs> frank comments that he heard fenner Prockway speak at reading university in 1982 when he tried to inspire uh, skeptical young people that we would live to see steps to disarmament soon. <laughs> Ever the optimist. <laughs> <laughs> my, my colleague Jane points out that we have over 80 um, pamphlets and other publications by Fenner Brockway. So yes, plenty to explore in the library if you want to come and find out more about this inspiring figure as, as uh, Leslie McCaw uh, uh, calls him. Uh, Melvin asks, do we have any examples of correspondence between Brockway and absolutist Quakers? Oh, yes. Um, I think, yes, definitely. In the Catherine Marshall archives, um, there are a number of, of letters to and fro between um, a, number of, a number of the leading figures. Um, in, in the No Conscription Fellowship. And some of them 
yeah, that, 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 that there were those connections there. Um, what, what there was, of course, was this big divide between um, those that would be absolutists and alternativists. And so there's that, I hadn't really gone into that in this debate, but there's, it's not all um, plain sailing in the No Conscription Fellowship. So there's a good deal of, of correspondence about the disagreements about what one should do if, if one's objecting. Um, so, so there's there's correspondence between those that agree and those that that disagree as well. And a lot of that Catherine Marshall archive actually has been digitised, isn't it? If you have to have a subscription to it, but but if you are attached to a university which has got a subscription, uh, I know a lot of that material was uh, was digitised at the same time as our run of the. Um, the, the tribunal was and and uh, the no conscription fellowship material if anyone wants to know more about that just drop us an email and i'll find you the reference um steve roman has reminded people about the conscientious objectors day vigil in manchester on saturday uh, and also virtual national events so there's details about both of those in the chat and we have two people waiting to ask a question ian you are the first if you wish to unmute yourself Right. Uh, yeah. Well, um, I, um, I, I particularly want, didn't want to uh, to miss the talk today because, um, you know, for several reasons, uh, um, I was well aware of um, uh, um, uh, Brockway's um, opposition to the to the First World War, and of course to his um, his role in the um, uh, his leading role in the in the No Conscription Fellowship which I, I've, I've mentioned in uh, The Drums of Armageddon about the British left and the outbreak of the First World War. Um, he's also features in my book on um, uh, Under Siege on uh, the, um, uh, the interwar ILP. And uh, I was going to ask um, uh, uh, about um, his, um, his having been such an absolutist in the, uh, uh, during the First World War, um, how he managed to become not an absolutist, in fact, not a pacifist at all, uh, when the, uh, the Spanish Civil War um, um, uh, was, uh, was raging in, uh, in the late 1930s. Uh, I mean, th there are several things that uh, somebody mentioned, um, 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 uh, somebody's already mentioned, um, uh, 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 meeting, uh, uh, seeing um, Brockway at a, a meeting uh, in uh, uh, where I, I've forgotten where it was now. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, and, and I mean, I, I can remember um, uh, sort of being sent off to meet him, um, and uh, we finally found him in a pub opposite the the, the uh, venue of the. Uh, uh, of the conference he was speaking at uh, back also in the in the, in the nineteen eighties when he, when he spoke in Brighton at some uh, some uh, event uh, that uh, uh, we organised. Um, so you know, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm very very grateful. Uh, I, I, I'm uh, I think it was a you know really excellent talk. No, oh, thank you. So okay. yeah, the, the bit about the uh, the the Spanish yeah. Civil War. Have you, have you got any more on that? Hazel? Yeah, well, it's interest it is interesting because yeah, you wouldn't have put money on Brockway being the one that renounces the absolutism um just a, a few years later, really. I think it there's there's a whole combination of factors. He moves much further to the left um by the late 1920s, beginning of the 1930s. There's the whole debacle of the disaffiliation, which Ian knows very well, the disaffiliation of the Independent Labour Party from the Labour Party, um, where Brockway is chair of the ILP when they go out of the Labour Party. Um, and he, he essentially becomes a revolutionary socialist. And he's having to reconcile this belief that things need to move faster. You know, he's lost complete faith in gradualism um, and things need to move faster, there needs to be a revolution, but how do you have a revolution if you are a complete pacifist? Um, and 
he, he wrestles with that for a long time and probably not very satisfactorily, but when the Spanish Civil War breaks out, um, it, they decide that the ILP will send a contingent and he gets involved in organising that contingent, which George Orwell went out, out with. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, 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 fact, it's factors about socialism. Um, and I think as, as he's moving through the 20s and into the 30s, um, he's, he's, I suppose, moving increasingly away from this more idealistic Christian spiritual version of socialism to something that is a bit more hard line, a bit more hard left, um, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I, I know we've got a couple of people waiting, but I'll just because Kathy Hunt's question in the chat seems to sort of follow on a bit from that. I'm wondering what sort of relationship Brockway had after the war with others in the Labour movement who were not COs. That's a, that's a really good question, isn't it? I mean, he, he maintains um, his, his networks uh, with the other COs like Clifford Allen, especially Clifford Allen, remain really important in, in the 1920s. Um, and Clifford Allen really becomes the leading figure for a while in the Independent Labour Party and Brockway therefore gets involved with him and becomes organising secretary, political secretary, etc., with that, um, and then he really becomes much closer to James Maxton, and this is where the sort of the move to the further left and the revolutionary socialism comes from. So a lot of his his close working relationships are those that have kind of travelled the same path as him. Um, but clearly, he he has all sorts of other networks going on. In the twenties, he's very busy. Um, with kind of the organising side of the ILP. Um, and so kind of knew everybody. He, he goes back to becoming editor of the new leader from 1926, that what the Labour leader had become. Um, and, and so he, he's got relationships and networks throughout the movement. Um, but I, I guess his closest relationships are, are with those that started off as CEOs with him. Thank you. There's some interesting stuff coming along in the chat. I'll make sure I send it on to you, Hazel, so that you see everything that's there. Anne, you've been waiting patiently. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yes. There you go. Oh, you have unmuted. Am I unmuted now? You no, are. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I've just had a message saying I've got an unstable link or something. Um, I just wanted to say um, a good talk, Hazel, and well done with all the. Um, all the research and you've done well to find the North Cheshire Herald if you went up to Tameside Library it's quite a difficult one to find and that's because um Mella where I live so oh, wow. <laughs> that used to be um that used to be in Tameside you know not in Greater Manchester or Cheshire or all the other places it's been and Baddock's the garage is still there um <laughs> fantastic <laughs> is red row still there hmm? oh, is yes. red row still there yes, yes. Oh, fantastic. yes. oh yes next to the um the war memorial and things go past it regularly in fact i know them i know the person that lives in the house he lived in and i've been around the back of it <laughs> to see the view over the mill and things like this which isn't there now but you um so, um, yeah, there was a whole, several of them that lived in a little cluster of them in Mellor and Marple and things, and um, which is good. I wanted to say as well that, um, they, that women played quite a big role in this whole thing and Ali helped us, oh, I didn't say, we, um, it must have been in tw 2015, yes, we did um, four posters for the and had an exhibition up, which the Working Class Movement Library helped with posters from them and from the Quakers in our local library in Marple. And the ones that we did, when I say we, I mean Stockport for Peace, we then took them down to the um, railway station in Marple at Rose Hill, and they were there for two, three months. And then they went to Marple Station in the waiting room and they were there for about a year, you know, wow. and I now have them here. And um, 
but doing the research for this, I know um, Phoebe did a lot at the Working Class Movement Library and got a lot of stuff, including, which you've probably seen, the letter that Lilla wrote. Um, I think, I can't remember, I'd have to check, but I can go through what I've got and send you stuff if you want, just in case there's something there that you, you haven't got. That would the, be marvellous, thank you. Yeah, because yeah. Lilla's such an important part of this, I think. Yes. I th yeah. yeah, I think she her story needs to be told with his, doesn't it? Well, we did, we did, um, one of the posters was on women in Marple, and we looked quite a bit into her life, but obviously we couldn't put a lot of it on the poster because you can only write a limited amount, but we've got a lot of information about her. Oh, that would be super if we could have a look at that. Thank yeah. you. At least you can see it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. There's, there's certainly still a, a panel to Lilla on Marple Station. Now, whether that's based on, on uh, your original poster, Anne, I'm not sure, but I was at Marple Station not long ago, and there indeed was uh, was Lilla staring back at me with, with quite a lot of information about her. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that was slightly separate to ours, but it was right. from ours. Yes, which is great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, right, thank you, Anne. Right, Frank, I'm keeping an eye on the time, but Frank, you have been patiently waiting, so. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I thought that was a really wonderful talk. Um, interesting the, to see the picture of um, with Tony Benn in his younger time, because as I wrote in the chat, uh, he was renouncing his peerage but I always yeah, yeah. knew of Fenner Brockway as Lord Brockway. Mm -hmm. um, what I, what I, and, and the other thing I wanted to say was about uh, his, um, the, the revolutionary, socialist revolutionary urgency. And we see that now in relation to the environment that, that some, some, some are saying, you can't save the environment without first getting rid of capitalism. And I, it seems so frustrating because I kind of agree with that. And yet we don't have time, do we? We've had two, 200 years of trying to get rid of capitalism and we haven't made much headway. And this environment thing's been building up and it's, you know, it's, it's even within my lifetime that it's a, a huge danger let alone people um, of the youngest generation um, so nothing specific to add I'm afraid but that's my contribution thank you yeah I'm not I'm not sure that um, that Brockway's revolutionary methods would, would be particularly helpful now um because he, he was sort of waiting for the working class to to organize themselves almost he had some he had some ideas about workers' councils, but he, he wanted those to come and kind of from below almost. So he, he was a bit woolly as a, as a revolutionary theorist. So I'm, I'm not sure, fond as I am of him, I'm not sure we can turn to him to, to, to solve current day problems. Um, yeah, but it is, it is interesting. He, 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 I think the urgency in the 30s was certainly a response to fascism and certainly, you know, um, a response to the economic situation as well and a, and a real response to the frustration with MacDonald and, and the notion of gradualism. Um, and and the, those that remained with the ILP really felt that something had to be done quickly then, but that I don't think they had the answer, sadly. Ali, are, uh, are you wanting to make an uncomfortable? Hey, yeah. It's just a question, really. Um, af yeah. After the First World War, oh, sorry, that's gone off again. Oh, oh. after the First World War, um, the NCF kind of transformed into the No War, um, the no, um, no War Movement, or, yeah? No More War Movement. No yeah. More War. Are there, do you know where the papers are for that, or are there papers? The Peace Pledge Union, I think, has, has, got, those. has got what there is, I think, but I haven't looked at those yet. Okay. Um, and I think the War Resisters International, I think they're in Amsterdam. Okay. 
Oh dear. <laughs> um, but whether they've been digitised, mate, hopefully. But <laughs> Okay. they've been digitized but yeah i think the peace the peace pledge union certainly has the journal of the no more war movement okay, okay. thank you very much thank you thanks ali thanks anybody steve would you like to unmute yourself there you go right okay sorry about the delay um Right, um, um, Hazel, you, you were talking about the um, idea of uh, lectures and concerts that Brockway was involved in doing um, uh, when, when, the, when the prisoners were supposed to be uh, silent. Um, I'm just interested in that particularly because um, I'm hoping to explore something like that myself in a talk I'm doing uh, in this forum in three weeks time, uh, looking at the Wandsworth uh, disturbances of 1918 to 1919, uh, where similar tactics were used. And I wanted to explore in that the uh, motivation for it. Uh, do you think the prisoners, uh, you mentioned the idea of well-being events like uh, so do you think the uh, prisoners were doing the lectures and concerts and sing songs and things uh, to promote their own well-being or was it to make a nuisance of themselves with the hope that the authorities might release them or was it uh, just an act of defiance to the kind of silence rule i just wonder what you think the motivation might have been please that's a really good question um i think it might have been a bit of all of that um i think brockway certainly um was missing kind of culture and reading material and all that side of things. So I think, I mean, he wouldn't have said well-being. That's kind of me putting a modern construct on it, isn't it? But um, I think, I think that it's certainly there's an element of that and just wanting some some food for the brain kind of thing and something to think about. And so that they that you know they're doing this by shouting out the windows and <laughs> and, and this kind of stuff. Um, I think they did want to make a nuisance of themselves. I, 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 no doubt about that. Um, and they did want to, he, he wanted to make a point about this idea of the silence rule, that that shouldn't be happening. Um, I, don't, I don't think it was about being released necessarily. Um, I think Brockway was quite determined to see this thing through and, and stay in prison. So I don't, I don't think that was part of it, but I think it was, it, it's it's a campaign. It's it is a political campaign, I suppose, in the same way that he would have organised something out of prison. You know, it's got different facets to it, and so there's a committee and there's there's communication with different people and and all that sort of thing. He, he's just an inveterate politician, really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, 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 think, I think certainly in terms of the ones with disturbances, uh, which, as I say, I'll talk about in three weeks' time. Uh, I think that's the conclusion I've come to as well, that because you linked it in your talk to the mental suffering that, uh, that the prisoners had. Uh, and I think that possibly, like you say, they wouldn't have mentioned the modern term well-being, but uh, subconsciously at least, I think it was a way of relieving the boredom, of relieving the silence, of having some kind of communication with each other. Um, and if that made the authorities um, you know, more displeased, um, so the better, really. I, I think that was, uh, that was certainly the conclusion I came to anyway. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks. Rose, uh, do unmute yourself if you wish. Um, yes, it's about the thing about silence, because when you talked about that earlier, I had no idea that that was a rule, you know, that was common at the time. And this is really not directly related, but it immediately made me think of the penal colony in Port Arthur in Tasmania in the um, 19th century, where they underwent an experiment with the most intractable um, of the prisoners there, and they, they set up a block which was a silent block and the prisoners were moved in there and at no time did they have any um, uh, physical presence with any other prisoner at all. They had to live in complete silence. They exercised alone. They, they built a little chapel that, went, that when they went there, they were, they were all in their own little closet and couldn't see anybody else. So the only person that they had any contact with were the guards. They were in their cells all day long, you know, apart from a little bit of exercise. And even the guards wore slippers rather than shoes to keep the noise down. Um, and it was the most inhuman, um, you know, sort of policy, really. Um, and 
an awful lot of them had very, very severe mental health problems as a result, you know, of that uh, policy. Yeah, that's so interesting, Rose, because I, I live in Lincoln and the only other example of a chapel like that in the world is, is in Lincoln Castle. Uh all oh, right, um, and and right. it's still there now. You can go and see it. So they're like, oh, well, we take the students yes. in there and the right. upright coffins. You have That's to right. stand in That's and right. yeah. not see anybody. Yeah, it's quite yeah. incredible. Yeah. Although, the one's still there in Tasmania as well. Yeah, that wasn't the prison that because the, the prison used to be in Lincoln Castle, but by the time Castle. Brockway was in Lincoln, mm. they were in a different. It's a it's a more modern building that he was being held in. Um, but that, yeah, that's a really interesting connection. Thank you. Gosh, yes, we haven't had Tasmania mentioned so far in the in the talks. That's uh, thank you, Rose. Okay, I think we're we're going towards a close. I've got I could take one final question, Melvin. Are you as wanting to ask a question? Yeah, okay. This you are you are the last question. Go go for it. Uh, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Um, uh, Hazel, you you've mentioned the division um between uh, amongst Quakers between those who were willing to enlist. Um, those who were absolutists and those who were alternativists. Um, to what extent were these divisions based on political affiliations? In other words, were um, socialist Quakers more likely to be absolutists, whereas um, liberals, political liberals, were more likely to be in the Friends Ambulance Brigade and alternativists? Yeah. And is there any research on that that subject being done? I, I think um, I think I see that Cyril Pierce is here at the talk, so he might be better qualified to answer this <laughs> than me. Um, but I, my understanding is that it, I think you're right. I think if if people were so had affiliations to socialism, they were more likely to be absolutists um but i i don't know that it necessarily is not always that cut and dried and part of what i've been thinking about with brockway is is that you know th this distinction between political and religious objectors is not as clear cut as it might originally appear you know with with his beliefs being so grounded in christianity um but i think in general, yeah, the hardcore of the absolutists were associated with the ILP and, and the NCF, I think, mainly. Uh, Cyril's nodding at you. Feel free to add something if you wish, Cyril, but you... But you. I wouldn't disagree with anything that's just been said. I think the only difference I'd... Uh, the only emphasis I'd add would be the extent to which individual Quakers who were firmly committed to the notion of the peace uh, testimony uh, we're also inclined to become absolutist too. Uh, you'll find a fair number of Quakers who are not particularly political, who became members of the absolutist group. See, we have everybody on hand we need, haven't we, really? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, good set of questions there, and Hazel's got more information than she started with, as well as having imparted lots to us. So. That's worked well all around. Thank you. Uh, thank you much, very much to everybody. And particularly, of course, thank you very much indeed to, uh, to Hazel. So next week, Wednesday, the 19th of May, we welcome Francis Chu to speak to us on the topic, Thomas Paine's Rights of Man, Uncommon Sense for the 21st Century. Francis will be joining us from the States. So please note our start time next week is 3 p.m. rather than our usual 2 p.m. And we hope that you can join us. A reminder, this talk has been recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel shortly. That's youtube.com forward slash WCM library. And another reminder, our talks are as usual free. However, we would like to encourage you to support the library if you're able to do so. And there is a donate button on our website. Thank you again and goodbye until the same time. Well, almost the same time, plus an hour next week. Take care in solidarity. Very best wishes from all at the Working Class Movement Library. Goodbye.